Don't call it stupid. Hi, this is Ray Harwood at Bigfoot Quest Magazine, and we have Carl Crew as our special guest and a secret uh, guest on the phone, Mr. Daniel Perez, both uh, deeply into the uh, Bigfoot community. So we'll start with Carl introducing him. Oh, no, we're going to do Daniel introducing himself. And the topic is going to be Peter Byrne. And so they're going to share the Daniel's going to share a bit of the history and his stories. And then Carl do his. And then uh, Tom Seward's going to chime in later and uh, give you his interesting story. And here we go. Daniel. Yes, this is Daniel Perez, age 60, born and raised here in Southern California. Not interested in the Bigfoot subject by a movie called The Legend of Boggy Creek. And when it was shown here in theaters, it was about 1973. Right, exactly. Yeah, hey, Tom, Daniel's telling us a quick story, and then uh, Carl's going to chime in, and then your turn. Okay. Hey, go ahead, Daniel. Uh, yes, as I was saying, uh, born and raised here in Southern California, got interested in the subject of Bigfoot by way of a movie called The Legend of Boggy Creek. That was about 1973, and I've been hooked ever since. And uh, because of social media and the Internet, I've found a lot of uh, more people who are interested in the subject as well. Uh, one final note, I am also the editor and publisher of the Bigfoot Times, which has been published for over a quarter of a century. Well, that's wow. awesome. And and your wow. next issue is going to be on on what topic again? Uh, the September edition, which should be out later this week, is going to be exclusively devoted to the late Peter Byrne, who passed away on July twenty eighth. That's excellent, and that brings us to the topic of today, which is going to be Peter Byrne. And now, um, Carl, do you want to chime in with your? You had some interesting stories. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think Daniel's finished yet, but <laughs> oh, well, he, um, he, he, he he can come in again. Well, I mean, Bo Bogey Creek. My father took me to Bogey Creek when I was a kid, and it blew my mind too. Yeah, um, I am the my great uh, uncle is Jerry Crew, and this is the guy that first took the plaster cast in 1958 on Mount Shasta, uh, Bluff Creek. With uh, he was logging there with my father and my other uncle Jim. And, uh, yeah, so I've grown up in uh, like hearing these, this history all my life, you know, and, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, I've been thrilled about it, but I mean, they kind of kept it from me a little bit as a kid, but as I grew older and I started going, wow, uh, you know, he, he they told me everything. So, uh, I still talk with Jerry's, uh, sons, uh, Wade, and I've talked with Hiram too. And, uh, but Peter Burns, um, I, I recently <laughs> spent about two and a half years writing, jerry cruz whole history into a feature film um and it's called the print and i got to interview peter verns like uh well i interviewed him formally three times but we talked a lot more but man i'm telling you i was just floored um it, it was like uh when you come into his presence uh he, i mean he was like 95 i think 94 when i when i first uh did the interview and it's like you know you're speaking with royalty you know you can't mince any words you have to be very succinct uh you know you, there's no joking around or anything <laughs> and uh, it was an honor it was such an honor i got so much information out of him um yeah he turned me on to all these different publications and uh, i couldn't even afford some of his early books like uh, his books on elephant hunting they're like three or four hundred bucks each because they're so rare and uh, but he was involved in hunting the yeti um in the Himalayas, uh, and that was also with Tom Slick, very famous millionaire, that was putting up the bill for all these people to hunt uh, Bigfoot. But uh, yeah, I was just, it was, I was staggered. They call him the Indiana Jones and Don Quixote, and uh, he deserves that title. He had, uh, he told me um, when he was in the Himalayas, he met some priest, like uh, uh, some you know Hindu priest, whatever, and they got drunk together. And he said, I want to show you a Yeti hand. And he, he took him in and showed him this Yeti hand. Later, he stole it and he brought it back to America. I think the story was he hid it in, uh, uh, who was that? Uh, some famous um, actor's wife's purse. Jimmy and he got Stewart. it back in the country. What? It was, it was Jimmy Stewart. 
That's right, Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this guy is like outrageous, man. He was uh, grew up in the tea fields in Ceylon. Um, and uh, yeah, just wow. You want to talk about an amazing life. Oh, my goodness. I, I was staggered. Yeah, I was staggered. Very, very happy. Okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, Daniel, you want to tell one of your stories and we'll go to Tom? I wanted to ask uh, for everyone to know, did Peter Byrne ever meet uh, Jerry Crew back in 58 or even 1960? Absolutely. Uh, he came into Willow Creek to uh, deal with a bunch of people that were on the dole from uh, Tom Slick that were, quote, hunting Bigfoot. And he had to fire a lot of people. He fired these two that were in jail. And uh, he fired somebody that was not even living there anymore. He went to San Francisco. And then he fired John Green, who wouldn't even take his call because he was so mad. Um, the only one he couldn't fire was uh, Bob Titmus. Because Bob Titmus said, oh, I'm working directly with, uh, you know, Mr. Slick. You can't fire me. I, I only talk to him. And I, we go into great detail about what happened later. But, yeah, he, he actually fired and hunted uh, 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 Bigfoot with Jerry and also my Uncle Jim. Yeah. But are there any photos from that time period of the two of them together? Um, very few. And I'm, I'm trying to get as many as I can. Uh most of them are with Hiram, his older son, and uh, I've been I've been trying to get them out of him. I just in, it was somebody from John, I think, from uh, Big, Western Bigfoot. He found an incredible picture that I've never seen. It was of Jerry on the uh, the uh, uh, bulldozer on the trail with these people all there, like at the scene of the crime. And it was in from a book that was found in Iowa. It blew my mind. I showed it to uh, to uh, my uh, aunt, and she freaked out. She goes, "Oh, I want to see this book so bad." But um, yeah, all those pictures are with Hiram, so I'm trying to get him. Yeah. Okay, and and uh, Hiram is uh, the his, eldest son. His oldest son. Yes. Yes. And and when you say oldest son, was he a biological son or was he adopted? I think he was, I believe it's biological. All his kids are biological, I believe. Yeah, I believe. I mean, he was really um, involved with the Hopi Indians. I mean, he would go to uh, every Sunday. He would not stay on the site at Willow Creek at, uh, at the, at the uh, place where they're, you know, everyone pulled up trailers and was staying where they were doing the construction and he wouldn't do it. He'd go home uh, every, every weekend because he went to church and he would take wow. Hopi Indian children to Sunday school every Sunday and nothing would stop him from doing that. He had a really beautiful relationship with the Hopi Indians. Yeah. Right. He sounds like a very, cause I had heard that too from other people that he was a real <laughs> big on church going. And uh, so that, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that Peter said about my uncle was that he had integrity and everyone who knew him knew he had integrity. And it set him apart from the other people that were telling wild stories like Ray Wallace. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we go into a great deal about old Ray. But uh, yeah, but back to Peter. Wow. Um, I was so um, horrified to hear that he actually passed because I really wanted to get him on some podcasts. He was just a plethora of information. And uh, I mean, have you, you spoke with him, right, uh, Daniel? Oh, yeah. He, he's been to the house here. Oh, that's so cool. Wow. He signed his book and sent it to me. I was so honored. Yeah. Well, I, I do have a story from 20 years ago. It's hard to believe it's already 2023. Wow. In 2003, I had a, a little bit of a party here at the house. Uh, kind of I'm a telling. And uh, I invited several people that, that were into the Bigfoot subject. And Peter was living in Southern California at the time. And so I invited him over. And it was early in the year, January, February, something like that. I forget the circumstance, but for whatever reason, the freeway was uh, tied up in traffic on a Sunday, I think. And it was like, it was the damnedest thing. When, when he got here, he was a little bit put off because of all the traffic. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how could you run into traffic on a Sunday? But it may have been an accident or something, but... He was stuck in traffic for quite a bit. <laughs> Welcome to L.A. Yes. 
Yeah, welcome to LA. Yeah, I'm so glad to be out of there. Oh, oh, oh. So, uh, can, uh, Thomas, do you want to tell the 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 story of your um, acquaintance with Peter? And uh, the the one I really liked you told me was when uh, he and Bob Gimlin were together, and you you met with them uh, at that uh, convention, and you were sitting in the sun in the chairs in the shade of the tree. Yep. No problem. Yeah, I first met Peter Byrne, I guess it was in 97. I wasn't a Sasquatch investigator there back then. I was just actually living and working in a bush off northeastern Vancouver Island and being a commercial fisherman traveling the coast. But I went, Dr. John Brindernagel, who was a good friend of mine at the time, told me to go to Vancouver to the Sasquatch conference in 97, I think it was. So I went and I got to meet, you know, Grover Krentz, Renee DeHinden, Todd Neese was there, apparently. I don't remember seeing him and a uh, few others. But then Peter Byrne stuck out because, to me, seeing him on TV and reading some of his books, it was kind of like, you know, starstruck to see Peter yeah. Byrne. So everyone spoke, and then John was up there on stage, and Mr. Bindernagel said, Tom, get up here and tell your encounters and your First Nations Indian perspectives on Sasquatch. So I got up there speaking about Chonakla, what we call Sasquatch, and you can see Peter Byrne in his khaki outfit or whatever you call that sort of uh, hunter garb, and uh, he was like just squirming in his seat, and then I was this, so I thought, okay, I'm going to really go in deep. So I went in deep with the tie from my tribe to the Sasquatches, the Chonakla, and the welcoming poles, ridicule poles, memorial poles, dowry poles, house posts, ladles, uh, slave killer daggers with Junoch on it. And he was very intrigued. And after I was finished, I went outside for refreshments and Peter came and grabbed me. And it was probably 40 minutes. He just kept grilling me on the indigenous people, my tribe's perspective on Sasquatch. So that was pretty neat. And then decades later, in 2017, Todd Neese invited me to Beachfoot down in Oregon. So I went, and there's Peter, and I hadn't seen him in who knows how, over 20 years. So went over and introduced myself. He remembered me, and he, you know, he says, "Oh yeah, I've been hearing about you." And you know, some people, a lot of people talk about what you're doing with Sasquatch Island and so forth, and conferences. And then Bob Gimlin, of course, was at Beachfoot that year, too. And I'm up at the pavilion listening to one of the speakers. And afterwards, I go out to the pavilion to have a smoke. And I look down to my tent with a canopy outside and a table and a couple chairs. And I had this. Actually, I got it behind me here. But I call it the foot of fame. It's a big 22-inch Bigfoot red cedar edge grain knotless prime chunk of wood that I cut out like a Bigfoot. And my plan was to carve it with a native design of Sasquatch. Well, I looked down and there's Peter and Bob Gimlin and they look like a couple kids that have got their armpit deep in the cookie jar and they're not supposed to. So <laughs> I thought, I'm going to go check on these old guys. So I go down there and they take it upon themselves to grab a Sharpie and sign my big oh, Bob Gimlin so and Peter cool. Byrne. And I looked at them wow. and I said, I can never carve this. You know, I got your two <laughs> names on there. I said, I'm never going to carve this. As a matter of yeah. fact, I think you gave me a good idea. I'm going to call it my foot of fame. <laughs> and every time I go to a conference or do a documentary with some of the other Sasquatch celebrities, call them what we are and get them to sign it. So now I got pretty much everyone's name on there, except for Daniel and you got to get your name on there yeah. and Ray. But I carry it around with me to all the conferences. And, oh, uh, so cool. You know, but that day I pulled the lawn chairs out in the shade and I sat there for probably over, well over an hour just listening to Peter Byrne and Bob Gimlin. <sighs> it was priceless. Yeah. It was one of those times where you just shut your mouth and yes. open your ears and maybe That's ask right. the odd question. But those two just went in deep oh, into yeah. their beginning of their careers out in the bush be it you know wow. hunting like peter and bob yes. doing his cowboy stuff yes. and then bluff creek came up and then the himalayas came up and you know i wish i had a video camera for that oh one man i'm just gonna say that. Oh. All that priceless yeah, priceless but, it was too bad hearing about his passing but we all got to go and uh but the, one of the things though is uh todd niece uh had a pretty tight connection with Peter Byrne and he did mention that Peter was giving him a lot of his notebooks and things like that so for follow-up if you guys are doing any research on Peter Byrne you might want to reach out to Todd Neese in Oregon oh cool yeah I did contact him and he was he, he was interested in being here with us today 
but he was in the hospital. He had uh, some kind of, uh, I think, some kind of vascular problem, and it was, oh, it was pretty him. severe. So, well, so Bob Gimlin, wow, Probably in a couple of weeks. Bob Gimlin, amazing man. Uh, I've heard many of his interviews, and uh, uh, we when I wrote the script for my uh, uh, Jerry Crew story, I wanted to cut all the legend nonsense out and get down to the real truth of what Bigfoot is, and uh, very much along the lines of what I heard come out of the mouth of Bob Gimlin, um, because one of the things he said that really struck me and was absolutely parallel with what my theories are is that he was on the site when they were shooting Patty. And he had a gun and he, and people go, well, you had a gun. Why didn't you shoot it? He goes, no, they were way too human. She was way too human. I'm not, if it came at me and tried to kill me, I would shoot it. But otherwise, no, 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 no. It was human. It was like human, too human. And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I don't believe that they're uh, Nephilim. I don't believe that they're from aliens. I don't believe like Ray Wallace. <laughs> And uh, I don't believe in evolution at all, but I think that there, I believe in uh, in uh, a certain micro evolution, which is the adaptation of species. Right, uh, adaptation, uh, adaptation to environments. Absolutely, yeah. There's billions of pieces of evidence of that. The other macro evolution, there's zero evidence that hasn't been debunked. So I know evolution in the macro sense is a religion. So you get involved with that, and people, oh, it's real, it's real. But you know what? It's like cognitive dissonance. They They've been taught this all their life and they, they can't allow uh, anything to, you know, even facts to change that position. But yeah, Bob Gillen, man, I, I pray I could meet him someday. Yeah. Amazing guy. Yeah. I went to his house uh, a couple of weeks wow. ago and uh, I, 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 no one was answering the door and whatnot. So I called him on the phone and his wife answered and said that he wasn't giving interviews anymore. Uh -oh. So I was thinking, darn, because <laughs> they, they would never answer the phone. So I just drove over there. And I said, I'll mow your lawn, I'll feed your horses, I'll, <laughs> I'll clean your clean your grain gutters, whatever it takes. And she said, no, no interviews. Oh, she, took, no, she said I could take pictures of the house, and I did. And that yeah. actually, people got mad at me for for doing that. But she's she oh, gave me okay. But anyway, he, he won't do he won't do Bigfoot conferences anymore, too, right? Uh, not according to his wife. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, he's getting pretty old. Last conference yeah. I seen him at about nine months ago or so at the Yakima conference. Is that the one uh, where he almost fell? a year ago? And you know, Bob being a Yakima Indian too, I can see him why he didn't want to squeeze, pull a gun and squeeze trigger. You know, because oh, yeah. us Indians, we all basically have the same belief that they are the other tribe. You know, I call them yeah. humans of the night. I've seen them close enough to look at them and you know see their facial features and everything, yeah. and they. You know, there's reports to them speaking the different native tongues, the shamans right. going to study with them. You know, the Omaha Indians, when I went down there, they taught me that their Sasquatch is Sitonga, keeper of the medicine. And that's where the medicine people learn their trade is interacting with the Sasquatches in that area. But that's indicative of quite a few tribes I've talked to, and especially here in British Columbia and Washington State. But yeah, it's, you know, but it's one of the things Bob and I and Peter Byrne, you know, we're discussing is, you know, the native connection and Peter and Bob both said, you know, they thanked me for bringing, stepping forward in 2015 and becoming a, you know, a sort of a, someone that's bringing his First Nations culture about Sasquatch into the whole Sasquatch community. Oh, cool. And, you know, educating people that, you know, if you want to know about Sasquatch, you know, look in your backyard at the local Indian tribe and go meet with them. They're going to fill you in if they're willing. They're going to give you lots of information. And that's what you know, I've been doing, but uh, both of them really enjoyed. They got to watch my wife do our traditional Chonahua dance and oh, wow. uh, mask and regalia. Wow. And, man, it was, I got pictures of them, you know, sitting there watching this Chonahua. Oh, come out. Peter said, of all the traveling I've done, that's, you know, it was great to see that. You need to write a book. I am writing books. Uh, good. You got to see those pictures, there? man. That's amazing. Everyone's still there? I'm still yep. here. Uh, okay, because yep. my screen went black for a minute. Oh, Sorry about Need that. more coffee. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask a question to Mr. Crew there. I wanted to ask, what was the relationship between Jerry Crew and Ray Wallace? Was your, was was Jerry working for Ray Wallace? And uh, yeah. 
Uh, it's a good question. Yeah, he wasn't. He his he was um, working with him. wasn't employed by him, but I mean, he brought him in to work the grounds. You know, he was a independent contractor, so he wasn't like a step and fetch it. But he was an independent contractor that was brought in. And actually, my father uh, was came in, um, and he was watering down the the roads up there because the dust was so much they have to water down the roads that they had just carved because of the nature of the uh, of the soil. And uh, he taught my uncle Jim, uh, who was uh, hanging out there, how to do it and everything. And uh, um, yeah, he uh, Jerry Crew. I remember meeting Jerry Crew as a kid a bunch of times, and he would come and do tricks for me. And, he was always had like uh, some foil in his pocket to make things disappear. He taught me my first magic trick, which was the French drop, which is how you do a quarter or whatever. Anyway, so cool. Um, but he was just had that natural nature of, uh, of talking to people and um, he was really good with people. Um, but back to your question, which was. The, the relationship between Jerry Crew and Ray Wallace. Yeah. Oh, well, I go into great detail about this. And actually, uh, Peter turned me on to a lot of information uh, um, about uh, how crazy uh, Ray Wallace was. He, he was really couldn't uh, read or write or uh, and he was a huge storyteller, you know, UFOs and everything. And uh, the, Ray Wallace was incredibly jealous of my great uncle because after oh. he went and learned how to make a plaster cast from Bob Titmus, who had the taxidermy shop and he did the plaster cast. He took it into the Humboldt times and uh, he had already uh, said, Oh, do you see those trucks over there? Bigfoot was here last night. He was already saying that before he even went in there. Some of the other um, uh, loggers on the site, they have testimonies about that. And uh, so he went in and they took it and they took pictures. He said, yeah, smile, Jerry, smile. He goes, I'm not going to smile. This is no joke, you know. And so they took the picture and it sat on the desk for a couple of weeks, but then they published it and it literally was the first thing to go viral globally. And Ray Wallace was always a stickler for, uh, you know, he's always wanted to be better than everyone else. And when that happened, he, it just really made him furious because he started, well, actually, because some of the people started quitting. They were spooked, you know, they, because they had heard stuff and seen stuff and a lot of them quit. And he thought somebody was trying to mess with them. But he was incredibly, insanely jealous over the publicity that uh, Jerry got. And Jerry was horrified. I mean, it's like, you know, he, he didn't want any of this publicity. Uh, you know, he's a very humble man. You know, he wasn't a drinker or anything, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, when he went into the Gonzoli's office and they said there's 2,500 calls that came in in a week from all over the world about this. And he's horrified. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they uh, you know, they were he shorty which was his brother uh raised brother i mean they got along i mean uh, uh, there was no outright um fights or anything like that but uh um yeah gray walsh was not pleased actually he's the one that contacted uh, his friend who carved the fake footprints and then they stomped them all over everywhere and ray went out there and you know pretended that he did them all which is a really interesting point and now that you have a, a native american online because when ray died his family said, oh, Bigfoot's dead. The guy who made all the prints, we did. He was His wife was the uh, Patty. She had a costume. He, that's Bigfoot's dead. And everyone bought it. It went all over the place. I mean, from uh, uh, um, Shepard Smith to everybody, Jay Leno. Oh, yeah, Bigfoot's dead, you know. Um, and then it took a while, and then people started understanding, wait a minute, wait a minute. This goes back hundreds of years. Wild men in the woods, Sasquatch. I mean, it's just absurd to think that he made all the prints that go literally all over America. I mean, it was, and the reason the family waited till he died was because he would never be able to handle the questions that came from reporters. You know, so the, he died, he got out of the way, and then they said, oh, okay, well, we have all his prints, and they're trying to make as much money as they can off all the fake prints that they that they left. And actually, when you look at the fake prints that he did, they look like a surfer's print. And then you see the one, I, there's a picture of uh, his print and then Jerry's print, which is organic and really creepy. Um, yeah, it's totally different. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I got to go into great detail about that. There's a really hilarious story Peter told me um <laughs> about uh when tom slick came to town to willow creek and uh 
Ray Wallace heard about it. He was like, hey, he had this money thing. Sniff, he was sniffing money, you know. And uh, uh, he said, well, I want to meet. I want to meet this guy. I want to meet this guy. So at the Willow Creek Inn, Peter Burns and Tom Slick sat there at the table. And they made it, They told him, come on by and say. So Ray Wallace came in this restaurant and uh, came up to him. And he was all nervous. And uh, they introduced themselves. And he said, well, I have a baby Bigfoot. And Tom Slick goes, what? He goes, yeah, I have a baby Bigfoot. I have, I caught it. It's up my place. How much do you want for it? And he got all sweaty and sweaty and looking around. <laughs> well, it's like $1,000. And this is 1959. Yeah. And, uh, and if Tom's like, okay, fine. He took out a check, wrote it, put it on the table. And then when Ray reached for it, he put his hand on it and said, no, you got to bring it. You got to, sh- you got to show me it. Oh, 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 okay. Well, uh, well, I'll bring it tomorrow morning. And so he sheepishly left and then they made bets on whether he'd come back. Well, he came back the next morning, walked in and said, Oh, I had to let it go during the night. It was sick. <laughs> and they're just shaking their head, you know, shaking their head. Um, there's just so many things like that, that he, that he told me that blew my mind. And I have in the script, um, a really great story about Bob Titmus, which I'm not going to reveal. You have to see the movie, <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, there wasn't any like uh, outward friction between the two, but Ray really, really was upset by everything. Yeah, yeah. A long winded answer to your question, Daniel. <laughs> you you mentioned that uh, that Ray Wallace was illiterate, and uh, how how was that established? Uh, was that was that uh, Jerry Crew mentioning it to someone? No, that was according to Peter Burns. Okay, because. That's kind of. I used to be in touch with uh, with Ray Wallace. Oh yeah. Like these uh, handwritten letters to me that were uh-huh. quite extensive. Well, I got. I mean, he wrote very famous nine letters that I got to see. So he it wasn't. I don't think Peter was correct, completely correct. But uh, um, I mean, if you read these letters, oh my goodness, it opens the uh, the uh, doors to the asylum. I mean, talking about UFOs and uh, all the Japanese, they got all them Bigfoots and they put them in these giant things, took them over to Japan. They froze them on ice and uh, all these uh, UFOs coming back and putting Bigfoots around. He's like, woo, woo, it was crazy. And they actually, they I guess uh, John Green got a hold of those letters, but they're they're online. Um, but you just, wow, it shows you the depth. He did. He would tell a story like nobody's business and that's what he would do in his roadside cafe with all these fake prints he'd tell stories and stories he, that's what he was known for so yeah i don't know that he was completely illiterate yeah so i would i would save those letters no, i would frame yeah, those I, letters what what i wanted to make mention of because i've got quite a few letters from ray cool um, probably from, from the early 80s that he used to write to me i'm not even sure how he found out about me but somehow he did and he started writing and I was okay. but uh, you could sense, even though he wrote uh, these letters that were just all over the place, you could sense yeah. the sense of illiteracy in him by his letters. There you go. Because there you go. Perfect. A kind of rambling in the sense that they were all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's. Uh, thank you for underlining my uh, uh, Peter's uh, position. <laughs> Fascinating I, stuff. I also, I also wanted to ask because I wanted to get some more confirmation on the point is that it was my understanding, and I think this is actually straight from Bob Titmus himself, who passed away, I think, in 97 or 98, that he said that he and Jerry Crew were childhood friends. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't think so. I think uh, he met. Bob Titmus uh, at the taxidermy shop when he went into town and he just walked into his store and he, he had taken um, some cardboard and drawn out uh, what the print looked like from the actual print and took it in. And he, that's when he met Bob Titmus. Um, so um, Bob, he said, he looked at it, he goes, you're out of your mind. This is, you know, someone's pranking you or something. And Jerry knew he wasn't being pranked because the actual prince went down the side of a ravine. There's no way anyone could do that. You know, um, uh, there were so many of them. And uh, um, so Bob Titman said, here, OK, well, do you know how to take a plaster cast? He showed him and he bought he sold him a plaster cast bit. I don't think he was a, a friend of his from a kid. No, no. OK, because 
I think that might be so, uh, but to my memory, I think that was Bob Titmus himself who said that, that they said that they grew up in the neighborhood together, I forget what state, and that they moved away and they didn't get reacquainted until Bob Titmus had his business in uh, not Reading, but maybe Red Bluff, his taxidermy business. Right. That may be true. I don't know. I'll have to ask Wade. Um, there are later uh, instances of uh, when he was in Reading um, where um, he was. Uh, in fact, one thing that Peter told me, they were he was with Jerry and Bob Titmus on a trail. And Bob Titmus um, was he goes, look at these. These are baby Bigfoot prints. And Peter and Jerry look at each other. That's a bear print. What are you talking about? No, that's a baby bear. I know it. And he took pictures of it and he sent them to Tom Slick. And they're just like, oh, man. And then later on, he sent hairs from a baby, from a Bigfoot, um, uh, from Redding to uh, Bob, uh, Tom Slick. And uh, at that very time, uh, Jerry went out to see him in Redding and he was doing a taxidermy of a moose with red hair. You know, like, yeah, a little too coincidental. <laughs> well, on the, uh, we only got five minutes left on this podcast thing, or uh, what do they call it, video log? As, uh, they only let me have 45 minutes. We've already burned it, so we're doing good. Great. So do you guys want to have another meeting? Uh, I mean, because we obviously didn't didn't get to, I mean, we have a lot more to talk about, it sounds like. Sure. You want to do it um, maybe next week? Oh, I'm up to it. Thomas is going to be on the Alaska Bigfoot cruise with um, uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Oh, uh, wow. Next great. week. So it would have to be when he gets back. Great. My yeah, friend just got a Dr. cast. My friend just bought a cast from Dr. Jeff, Jeff Meldrum, Johnny from uh, Western Bigfoot. Oh. And uh, yeah, yeah, I want to get one too. I have one from yeah. Jerry, but it's like the fifth generation is all flat. These are like more, uh, more, you know have more texture to them so <laughs> and then after after yeah, that uh, it, i don't know what you guys are might be busy or not but thomas is putting on a um dr dr bender nagel cruise uh with a with a a big like a big fishing boat out uh into vancouver yeah. island uh the first part of october wow so so i'm gonna go with Sas them. Best thing to do is join Sasquatch Island on Facebook. I do all my posting on there. Great. But yeah, tomorrow morning we launch at, or tomorrow afternoon we launch from Seattle to Ketchikan, Juneau, Icy Strait, Victoria, BC on the way back. But I'm going to be sharing my lifetime of being a commercial fisherman and hunting wow. guide for grizzly bears all through the British Columbia coast. So I'll be wow. up on deck showing where all the different uh, sightings took place, especially the Buttedale uh, encounter that's. Uh, John Green wrote about in his book, the what do you call it, Sasquatch, Great Apes Among Us. That Buttedale one was the first one of a recorded of uh, Sasquatch actually swimming. And I knew a watchman at Buttedale Cannery who used to hear the Sasquatches there and see the tracks in the snow on the boardwalk. So that's what I'll be doing on the cruise ship, sharing everything I've heard through a lifetime. Oh, wow. Cool. So I, I'm hearing, I'm, I'm hearing like the essence of, of Peter Byrne out of you. Yeah, you're 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 uh, you're very similar in, in certain ways, you know, with all your experience. It's, yeah, it's he's an got honor to you. Knowledge up the kazoo. Well, yeah, that, you put me be on great. your podcast, so, though. Interview if get, me if I could get the three you three you uh, three of you back uh, when when Thomas gets back. Would that be okay, Daniel? Sure, I don't see a problem with that. Okay, thanks, and we can maybe come up with another topic in between, or just continue. It sounds like we're doing great now. <laughs> but um so carl's making a, a movie and he said we could be uh extras in the background so if yeah to... <laughs> i get your big big foot costumes all ready to try on yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> i'll be the no, guy no, it's I'll great to see you again <laughs> daniel and it was a pleasure meeting you ray and also uh it's an honor to be to meet you too um amazing i'm i'm honored yeah thank you so much Okay, Tom, okay, thanks, thanks lot, for being here, and Carl and Daniel. And as uh, soon as Thomas gets back from his ocean voyages, we'll uh, get back together. Bigfoot uh, Island. I'll, I'll look for it on Facebook. Uh, so Sasquatch, it's, uh, Sasquatch Island. Island. Oh, Sasquatch. I'll send, you a I'll send you a link. Yeah, there it is. Cool. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. All thank right, you very guys. much, guys. And I'll talk to you, uh, I guess, in about a week or two. Happy Labor Day. Okay, thanks a lot for joining. Yeah. Much pleasure. Take care. Hey, thank you, guys.